and I want to welcome you to our monthly webinar series and give you a little bit of background on eSIG first. For those of you not familiar with eSIG, we're a membership-based nonprofit corporation providing our members with objective information and resources for renewable energy and energy systems integration decisions. We also provide peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities, information and knowledge sharing, and professional education experiences. Our most recent activity was our fall technical workshop in Denver in October, and our next activity will be the spring technical workshop outside Albuquerque in March, just four weeks away, which will be followed by an international energy systems integration workshop in London. These workshops deal with a full range of issues associated with integrating wind and solar into electric, gas, and thermal systems, and they also deal with the coupling to energy consuming infrastructure especially electric transportation, buildings, and industry. Registration is now open for both Albuquerque and London, and everyone is invited to attend. ESIG is a very unique organization, and I don't think you'll find anything quite like it anywhere else in the world. If you're new to ESIG, I strongly encourage you to follow up with us if you like what you hear, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You can find us at www.esig.energy, as well as on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay, just a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, the phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. So please use the question and answer box on the lower right-hand side of your screen to submit questions, and we'll save 10 minutes or so at the end for the Q&A period. We plan to wrap it up at the top of the hour, and an email with a link will be provided once the presentation and audio file have been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar, so don't be afraid to use the Q&A box at any time during the webinar or as we move into the Q&A period. Okay, so today's webinar topic is the evolution of ERCOT's frequency control and ancillary services while integrating a high share of inverter-based generation. Based on pre-registrations, it looks like this is a pretty popular topic. For those of you old enough to remember, I'm reminded of the well-known words of Bob Dylan, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the winds are blowing. Okay, the webinar will feature Julia Matoivasan, better known as Julia M for obvious reasons. Julia, I hope I didn't do too bad with your name. Julia is the lead planning engineer in the resource adequacy group at ERTA, where she's been working since 2012. I first met Julia about five or six years before that when she was working at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, where she got her PhD in 2006. She serves on a number of technical advisory committees for high renewable energy penetration projects carried out by NREL, APRI, NERC, Hawaiian Electric, Xcel Energy, and the European Union, as well as being a strong contributor to ESIG. I should also mention that Julia is the recipient of one of our ESIG Excellence Awards this year. Congratulations, Julia. I have <clears throat> I've been very fortunate uh, to know Julia and to have her with us today. On a personal note, as I've gotten in the habit of doing, I took a look on LinkedIn last night and I found out that Julia and I have 140 shared connections. As you might guess, Julia is a good friend and as a bonus, she has a wonderful personality. It's a pleasure working with her and I look forward to hearing what she has to say today. The webinar will discuss a number of innovative and dynamic initiatives introduced at ERCOT to maintain frequency performance of the interconnection under increasingly low inertia conditions, including primary frequency response requirements from all generators, system inertia monitoring, and reserve sufficiency monitoring. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And Julia, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much for a nice presentation, uh, for presenting me uh, to people. Uh, I'm really humbled by getting an award and would like to use the opportunity to thank you as well. Uh, so without any further ado, um, I'll just start. Uh, my name is Julia Matevosian. I'm a lead planning engineer in resource adequacy group in uh, ERCOT. So uh, ERCOT is independent system operator for about 90% of Texas load. Uh, we are not synchronously interconnected uh, to the rest of the U.S. Uh, there is only a small number of uh, DC ties that we have. Uh, 
our peak load was 73.5 uh, gigawatt uh, with peak in summer due to air conditioning load. And you can see that our uh, DC tie is only uh, less than 2% of our peak load. What makes uh, our system operation um, even more challenging is that our resource lo loss uh, contingency criteria uh, is two nuclear units, two largest nuclear units, which is 2750 megawatts. Uh, so we are planning uh, for the tri simultaneous trip of these two units not to go into under frequency load shed. Uh, being a single interconnection uh, without any synchronous ties to the rest of the U.S., uh, it makes balancing a pretty challenging task. Uh, and we are requiring all generators on our system to provide primary frequency response. And I'll talk more about it uh, later. I just wanted to provide it as a background. We have... Uh, Four types of ancillary services, uh, and I'll explain uh, step by step about what's the functionality. Uh, so I'll start with responsive reserve service. Uh, this service is used for frequency containment. So if you look at the uh, frequency trace after a large generator trip, um, in the first uh, several seconds after an event, uh, this is where responsive reserve is being used. Uh, to arrest frequency and not let it reach under frequency load shed uh, trigger point. Uh, our responsive reserve service is being provided by generation resources uh, through governor response or through primary frequency response. Uh, and also a large portion of responsive reserve is being provided by load resources with under frequency relays. And I'll talk much more in detail about that uh, throughout my presentation. Uh, so, um, Next reserve we have is uh, regulation, and this is used, among other things, for frequency restoration. So this, in this uh, going back to the straight here, this is to uh, recover frequency back to 60 hertz. Uh, additionally, uh, regulation up and down reserves are being used for balancing between uh, five minutes real-time market runs. Uh, so during this time, Load may vary, wind may vary, solar production may vary, and so this is where uh, regulation up and down is being used. Uh, and then we have a replacement reserve uh, called non-spinning service. Uh, going back to the straight here, this replacement reserve is being used uh, to replenish used up responsive reserve and secondary reserve. Uh, but also non-spinning reserve is being used uh, to cover for um, uncertainty in load forecasting, wind forecasting, and solar forecasting. As you can see on the slide here, part of responsive reserve is also used as, re uh, as replacement reserve. So we have this 10-minute component in the responsive reserve used as replacement reserve uh, right now. Uh, so this is a chart showing our wind development uh, over time. Uh, the blue uh, bars here are showing how much wind we have installed in every year. And you can see here that we uh, finished 2018 with uh, about 21.7 gigawatts of uh, wind generation. Uh, this uh, burgundy uh, bars are showing how much uh, we have uh, in the pipeline with sign interconnection agreements and financial security posted. So these projects are more likely to be built and then the green bars are showing projects with just signed interconnection agreements, so there is more uncertainty about if these are going to be built or not. But even uh, looking at, uh, at this project, you can see that we are still planning to increase uh, our wind generation uh, going into 2021. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned, currently installed capacity is 21.7 gigawatts. Uh, our output record uh, was 19.6 gigawatts. And what's remarkable about that, that's about 90% of installed capacity. So this is a really high uh, output that we got uh, from all installed capacity that we had. And we also just recently uh, had another penetration record. So this is a percentage of load that was served by wind generation. And that reached 56% uh, in January this year. Uh, solar uh, chart looking not as exciting as wind, but uh, we also plan 
increase in solar in the coming years. Again, here, same uh, convention uh, on this chart. The blue bars are showing how much we have installed already. So we finished 2018 with about 1.7 gigawatts of solar. Uh, and uh, this is expected to double this year and double again next year. So as uh, inverter-based generation was being added to our system, it was displacing synchronous generation in unit commitment and uh, synchronous generation was providing inertia and frequency response. So uh, our system had to adapt by changing frequency control practices, increasing situational awareness, and also changing ancillary services products. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, all generators in our system are required to have uh, primary frequency re uh, response enabled. Uh, so for conventional generation, it means uh, having governors in service. And until 2012, wind and solar resources were not required uh, to participate in that. Uh, but from 2012, ERCOT implemented requirement for wind and solar generators to also provide primary frequency response. And this was because we were starting to see more over-frequency events as wind was building out. And so um, it was necessary that wind provide frequency support as well. I want to clarify that it means they don't have to reserve capacity to provide primary frequency re response. It just means they have to have primary frequency control uh, activated. And if they have a headroom available, they would provide response. So on this chart here, you can see uh, wind resource response during over-frequency events. Uh, the light blue, bar, uh, light blue chart is showing uh, frequency trace. Uh, and the dark blue is showing uh, wind production from one of the wind resources. And you can see as the frequency went up, uh, the wind resource reduced this production uh, to respond to a frequency event. Uh, on the right-hand side now, you can see a chart where wind resource is responding to under-frequency event. And again, you can see uh, in a light blue color, it's frequency and frequency is going down. And as it happens, wind resource is increasing its production. So what it means in this case is that this wind resource was probably curtailed due to transmission constraints. And therefore, they had uh, capability to increase their production and respond even in under-frequency events. I just want to stress out again that this was not a requirement for them to keep headroom to provide response in under-frequency events. It just happened that they were curtailed, and therefore, we happen to have this extra reserve. About 2,000 megawatt of older plants uh, are still exempt from this requirement because they were not able to retrofit uh, due to technology that's used at the plant. Uh, then, uh, in, uh, before April 2014, uh, we had more wide dead band for primary frequency response on all resources. It was 36 millihertz. And then in April 2014, a new regional NERC BAL TRE001 standard uh, became effective, and that uh, reduced uh, governor dead band on all resources, on most of resources, to 17 millihertz. Uh, so this is excerpt from the standard, and you can see here that wind uh, and uh, other renewable generation is also required to provide a primary frequency response with uh, uh, at most 5% droop. So with increasing uh, integration of inverter-based generation, uh, there could be periods in time when we have less synchronous uh, machines dispatched uh, or committed and dispatched. Uh, and during this situation, system inertia um, is becoming less, and it's important to have adequate frequency response during those times. So here you can see schematically uh, this is showing frequency response after a uh, large generated trip. And you can see the frequency in the first few seconds uh, the rate of change of frequency is purely a function of uh, system inertia uh, and the size of a uh, unit trip. So for the same unit trip, if you have high inertia, then the rate of frequency decline uh, will be higher, so the frequency declines slower. And if inertia is lower, then frequency is declining uh, much faster. 
So what happens uh, when, as we integrate more inverter-based generation and it's di displacing synchronous generation in the unit commitment, uh, inertia is going down and rate of frequency decline is becoming faster. Uh, so in 2013, as instantaneous wind penetration reached about 30 uh, percent, we started uh, to think about inertia and if, do we need to be concerned about it. And uh, by 2015, we implemented real-time inertia calculation. Uh, so how we do it, we have a unit status telemetry from every generator on our system. And we also have uh, inertia constants uh, from every synchronous generator uh, on our system. So we can calculate in real time uh, what actual system inertia is uh, just using inertia constant and MVA base of each online synchronous unit. Uh, so this, uh, in 2016, uh, this inertia calculation was turned into inertia monitoring and it was implemented in the control system, in the control room. Um, so you can see here how the screen looks like. Uh, in blue, uh, you can see actual uh, real-time inertia. Uh, and then in green, this is inertia forecast. So how we do inertia forecasting, uh, this is based on current operating plans that every generator submits to us every hour. Uh, so current, uh, current uh, operation plans span uh, 168 hours ahead. And among other things, they report to us if a generator is going to be online or not. So this is important information to consider in, free, uh, in inertia forecasting. Uh, so we take this current operating plans and based on status of, plan status of uh, generating units, uh, we can estimate what inertia is going to be in coming hours. Of course, this estimation is more accurate for uh, several hours ahead, one to two, three hours ahead, but then it's becoming less accurate. Uh, but then, as I said, uh, generators are updating their current operating plans uh, every hour, uh, so we can keep updating our inertia forecasting. We also monitor inertia based on uh, generation type, and this is more just for records and uh, for offline analysis, so we can trend uh, inertia from different generation types. Uh, so we started thinking what is the critical inertia level, so what is the absolute lowest level of inertia that we can uh, reliably operate at uh, with our existing frequency control practices. Uh, so for us, as I already mentioned, uh, the criteria is simultaneous trip of two largest nuclear units, and in this case uh, we shouldn't go into under-frequency load shedding. So with the level of inertia, uh, absolute minimum level of inertia and frequency response uh, mechanisms that we have at the time, uh, we should not go in under frequency load shed for simultaneous trip of two nuclear units. So uh, as I already mentioned, if, if a large generator trips in our pod, we have primary frequency response that will automatically be deployed uh, from generation. Uh, with 17 millihertz dead band and 5% roof, and full response is delivered between 12 to 15 seconds. Um, this is just based on uh, synchronous generation technologies that we have in our generation mix. And then the second type of response that we'll get uh, for larger unit trips uh, is load resources response. And you can see here on the chart, uh, the blue is showing frequency and Gray is showing how load resources will respond. So at 59.7 hertz, uh, the load resources will trigger and they will uh, stop consuming power in this way, providing frequency response. And full response is delivered within half a second. So compare with, with, with generation response from 12 to 15 seconds and load response is half a second. So this is fastest frequency response that we have available right now. And so this time of response, that's what matters when we determine critical inertia. So for ERCOT, critical inertia is minimum level of inertia uh, that after a trip of 2750 megawatts will give load resources sufficient time to respond before frequency reaches under frequency load shed. Uh, so if you look at this curve here, this is frequency after trip of 2750 megawatts from the simulation. Uh, we have a minimum amount of PFR at 1150 megawatts. That's what is set uh, in ERCOT. 
So uh, a certain time will reach 59.7 hertz, and this is when uh, relay start counting time, uh, relay for load resources. Uh, start counting time, and it will respond in half a second, as I mentioned. But during this time, frequency will continue declining, and uh, it may eventually reach under frequency load shed trigger. So what we want is this time to be longer than time it takes for load resources to respond. Because if this time is longer, then load resources will respond and frequency will uh, go up again. So they will be able to help arresting frequency before it reaches under frequency load shed trigger. Uh, so with that, uh, we've done a number of uh, dynamic studies uh, for different inertia levels. So cases from 2 to 13 are based on real-time snapshot cases. And cases, uh, case uh, 1 is a theoretical case uh, specifically conditioned for lower inertia. Uh, just to mention, at the time when study was carried out, uh, the minimum inertia that we had uh, in real time was 130 gigawatt seconds. Uh, right now, the lowest we had was 127 gigawatt seconds. So we still didn't get to this uh, lowest inertia case in reality. Uh, so uh, as I said, dynamic study was carried out for uh, all the 13 cases. And in each study, 2750 megawatt was tripped. And time it takes uh, for frequency to travel from 59.7 hertz to 59.3 hertz was recorded from every study, from every case. Uh, so what this curve is showing here is uh, inertia levels versus time it takes for frequency to travel between 59.7 hertz and 59.3 hertz. Uh, and you, you see here the dots, these correspond to uh, what was uh, recorded from the case studies here. So this is time it takes for frequency to get from 59.7 to 59.3. Uh, so as I mentioned, load resources have maximum 0.5 seconds uh, to respond um, once frequency reaches 59.7. But in reality, we've done uh, a survey of load resources, and it turns out, on average, they respond slightly quicker at 0.42 seconds. Uh, so if we draw this line uh, at 0.42 seconds, uh, we can find critical inertia of about 94 gigawatt seconds. So as long as we have inertia above this level, uh, for the trip of 2750 megawatt of generation, it will leave enough time for load resources to respond and arrest frequency before it reaches under frequency load shedding trigger at 59.3 hertz. Uh, so, with a little bit of margin, critical inertia level uh, for ERCOT was set at 100 gigawatt seconds, and the monitoring uh, was implemented in the control room. Um, so, visual, visual alarms will be raised if inertia gets close to critical, and you can see here uh, the levels and colors that will be used uh, in the control room. Uh, we monitor, uh, the system operator will monitor grid conditions closely when system inertia gets to 120 gigawatt seconds and below, and the operator can take actions as the inertia gets below 105 gigawatt seconds, and the target will be to increase uh, inertia to above that level. So possible actions uh, that operator can take is deploy non-spinning reserves from offline generation, so they can bring online generation, uh, offline generation that carry non-spinning reserve online, and they'll bring inertia with them. Um, then uh, they can deploy quick start generation resources that don't carry non-spin, and quick start generation resources are fast generators that can start and get to certain megawatt level within 10 minutes. And then if this doesn't uh, bring system inertia to above 105 gigawatt seconds, system operator can commit additional generation uh, resources uh, that can be turned on within an hour. So these are all theoretical actions that operator can take. So there is a plan in the control room, but uh, again, I wanted to stress out that we didn't get to that low inertia level yet. Uh, the lowest we've seen was 127 gigawatt seconds. Uh, another um, interesting thing is that critical inertia is a function of largest 
uh, n minus two contingency. So if our largest contingency wouldn't be that big, 2750 uh, megawatts, then our critical inertia could have could have been lower. And so we are currently in the process of adding real-time updates to the largest n minus two contingency based on actual unit availability and production in real time. Uh, so what it means, uh, basically, the monitor will look at uh, what's the largest contingency, n minus two contingency at the time, and based on that, we'll look up what critical inertia is in reality. So this will allow to lower critical inertia at times when largest generators are on maintenance uh, or are generating less uh, than their maximum. So in reality, this is equivalent to uh, reducing largest contingency. Uh, we cannot reduce largest contingency because it's a nuclear generator, so we cannot control how much they output, but if they are on maintenance or producing less uh, on base side, then we can monitor it and lower critical inertia based on that in real time. Uh, then the question is, what is lowest inertia level that uh, we'll have at all times with current operating practices? So what, what are uh, synchronous generators that are online at all times just because the way we operate the system. So for this, we looked at uh, low inertia instances in between years to, uh, 2013 to 2018, and we determined uh, minimum uh, inertia from components that are online at all times uh, due to various operation practices. So these components are private use networks, so we have something um, called private use networks. These are large industrial sites that have generation uh, on their site, some, sometimes to back up, sometimes to produce steam for, uh, for industrial processes. Uh, so these generators operate uh, at certain minimum level at all times, um, and we see that they don't even correlate to energy price at times. So they are online uh, basically all the time. Um, then there are generators providing responsive reserve. As I mentioned, we have minimum of 1150 megawatts of responsive reserve that has to come from generation. And additionally, each generation resource cannot carry more than 20% of its capacity towards responsive reserve. So that means that this 1150 megawatts uh, will be spread around uh, a larger amount of units and these units will bring inertia with them. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, nuclear generation, we have four large nuclear generation units. Uh, they are basically base load. Unless they're on maintenance, they are always online and bring inertia uh, with them. And they are, they are large inertia units as well. So if we look at how much inertia we have basically at all times, uh, we can see from this historic analysis from 2013 to 2018, that we get minimum from nuclear units of 18 gigawatt seconds, uh, minimum from generation providing auxiliary services at about 45 gigawatt seconds, and then minimum inertia from private use networks, so this industrial site generation, about 32 gigawatt seconds. So this already brings us to 95 gigawatt seconds of base inertia, so which is looking very good um, given that our critical inertia is 100 gigawatt seconds. And so at most, additionally, we would need another five gigawatt seconds uh, of inertia needed. Uh, a little disclaimer here says so this is based on historic data, and so this may change as private use networks change the way they operate, uh, nuclear units may be on maintenance and, 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 or not the way they operate, and then how much ancillary services is being carried by uh, synchronous generators. This may change as well. But for now, this is how it looks like. Um, then above critical inertia, our inertia still varies uh, widely uh, over time, time of the day and season. And so we asked ourselves the question uh, if we have sufficient amount of responsive reserve service at all times during different inertia conditions. So before summer 2015, we used to procure 2,800 megawatt of responsive reserve at all times. Um, but then uh, in 2015, we carried out a study, again, for different inertia levels based on recent real-time cases. Uh, and the criteria for study was 
at each inertia level in each case, uh, the amount of responsive reserves should be sufficient that for a trip of 2750 megawatt of generation, we shouldn't touch under frequency load shedding. Uh, so the goal of the studies was to obtain minimum amount of responsive reserve needed uh, to, to fulfill this criteria, and then also equivalency ratio between load resources providing responsive reserve and generation resources providing responsive reserve. So as I mentioned, load resources, they respond faster and they provide full response within half a second, whereas uh, primary frequency response from generation takes 12 to 15 seconds until full response, even though the response starts immediately. So we found that during low inertia conditions, load resources are more effective uh, in providing response. Uh, so this is, this is showing results from the studies. Again, dots correspond to, uh, to actual case results. Uh, on the first chart on the top here, you can see uh, on X axis inertia levels. And then on Y axis, this is megawatt reserve requirement in uh, primary frequency response terms. So this is assuming that all primary frequency response is being provided by uh, generators only, how much megawatts of reserve we would need in every, at every inertia level. Uh, then the second chart here is showing uh, equivalency ratio that I mentioned between load resources and generation resources providing responsive reserve. So you can see here, um, as inertia is getting lower, the load resources are more effective, as I mentioned. So it goes up to about 2 point, almost 2.5 uh, times. So what, the way you read this is that one megawatt of load resource is as effective as 2.5 megawatt of uh, primary frequency response from generation. So this allows us to lower total amount of uh, responsive reserve that we procure if we have some of it provided by load resources. Uh, so you can look at, uh, at this in chart here. So on the right-hand side, you can see responsive reserve requirement for 2018 uh, based on historic inertia conditions. And you can see that we need more uh, during springtime at nighttime. And uh, this is uh, logical because during these times we have more uh, wind generation and so less synchronous generation is uh, committed and inertia is less. But during summer time, uh, because our load peaks in summer, we have a uh, lot of synchronous generation committed and inertia is high and so we need less reserve. And you can see the range of reserve, depending on inertia conditions, is from 2,300 megawatts to 3,200 megawatts. Keep in mind that about half of this uh, responsive reserve is provided by load resources. And as I mentioned, during low inertia conditions, they are more effective uh, than, uh, generation res uh, then response from generation resources. And so on the left-hand side, you can see equivalency ratio uh, during different times of the day and uh, times of the year. Again, you can see here that during low inertia conditions, uh, load resources are more, uh, more effective than generation resources providing responsive reserve, but during high inertia conditions, they are basically as effective. So it's almost the equivalency ratio is at one. It doesn't matter if you get one megawatt of responsive reserve from load or from wind, or from load or from generation, I'm sorry. Uh, so as I mentioned, responsive reserve requirements are determined uh, ahead of time based on historic inertia conditions. We published reserve requirements at the end of the year before the next year starts. Uh, and so the question is, what if in real time inertia is different from what we expected? Uh, so in real time, what we do, we determine actual uh, responsive reserve requirements based on expected inertia conditions in the day ahead, and we also keep monitoring it going into real time. And if we see that responsive reserve that we procured uh, is insufficient, we may either rely on other available frequency responsive capacities, or we can op open supplementary ancillary services markets. Uh, so this is uh, probably a little bit hard to see, but I'll try to explain. This figure here shows how monitor looks like. So this is responsive reserve sufficiency monitor. 
uh, on the left-hand side, the solid green curve is showing how much responsive reserve is needed uh, uh, at the time based on uh, inertia conditions at the time. And then the red curve uh, on top of it is showing how much was actually procured uh, based on historic uh, inertia conditions for this day and this month. Uh, the blue curves here show uh, how much responsive reserve in primary frequency response terms, so taking equivalency ratio into account, uh, is needed uh, versus how much overall frequency responsive headroom is available on all resources uh, on our system at the time. And so again, if we are, if we are short, in this picture, you can see that we are at some, sometimes we are short of uh, responsive reserve, uh, but here you can see that we have other frequency responsive capacity to provide uh, frequency response, so we are not concerned. Um, and uh, on the right hand side here, this, these are forecasts. So this is a forecast based on forecast inertia. We can forecast how much responsive reserve will be needed compare it uh, to how much responsive reserve was procured uh, and, and decide if we are short uh, or sufficient. Um, historically, load resources provided about 50%, were limited at 50% uh, of total responsive reserve requirement, and this was on one hand to allow more diversity in the responsive reserve service, and then on the other hand to avoid frequency overshoot as all of these resource, world resources respond at same frequency in about same time. Um, now as wind and solar resources are providing primary frequency response as well, as I mentioned, uh, frequency overshoot is uh, less of a concern. And so in November 2017, the limit for load resources participating in responsive reserve service was increased uh, to 60%. So now they can participate more in responsive reserve service. Um, another exciting change that just happened uh, in ARCOT is uh, a proposed changes to ancillary services uh, were approved. The mar uh, one of market participants came out with uh, proposed changes uh, in the beginning of last year, and so it, it just got approved here. Uh, the changes that are being introduced is new fast frequency response sub-product of responsive reserve service, and this uh, sub-product will respond at higher frequency, at 59.85 hertz, uh, and it will respond faster than load resources, so uh, full response will be provided in uh, 0.25 seconds, and sustained time is 15 minutes. So this is additional, even faster frequency response that we will be able to procure. Uh, we also unbundle the 10-minute uh, component of responsive reserve service into a separate service, that, which will be called ERCOT Contingency Reserve Service. Uh, and now it will be uh, possible to provide it from online and offline generation uh, and also load resources. Uh, so previously this, this was part of responsive reserve. It was bundled with frequency containment reserve, uh, which made the requirement that all generators providing the service have to be online and load resources cannot provide the service either. So, so, so now it's, it unbundles this 10-minute component and makes it more available to other technologies to participate. And then non-spinning reserve quantities will be reduced by amount of this uh, new service that we procure. So fast frequency response will be implemented by January next year. Uh, that, that's the plan for now. And the ERCOT Contingency Reserve Service will be implemented by January 1st, 2022. So this uh, chart here is showing the effect of having faster frequency response on critical inertia number. Uh, on this chart you can see, so this is a reference. That's what I've talked about in my presentation. If we don't have this faster frequency response, then critical inertia right now is at 94 gigawatt seconds with current response times for load resources. If we uh, have faster frequency response, resources responding at 59.85 hertz within 15 cycles, uh, then we can lower critical inertia to 84 gigawatt seconds. So this faster and earlier response allows us to lower critical inertia number. So if we go back to this uh, base inertia analysis that I've talked about and look again at, at what we had, we already have 
right now about 95 gigawatt seconds of base inertia that is online basically at all times. And so if new critical inertia number with some margin above 84, so say at 90 gigawatt seconds, um, is 90, so we actually always have this critical inertia served by components that are online at all times just because the way we operate our system. Again, keep in mind that these components may change and the way they operate may change, so we keep monitoring and trending inertia from these components uh, from year to year just to track these changes and see if something happens. So just to conclude, um, as generation makes changes for ERCOT, uh, we are taking proactive role in introducing gradual changes to frequency response mechanisms. Um, it's very important that all generators, including wind and solar um, in ERCOT, are required to provide primary frequency response. So this is just capability without reserving capacity. Um, Responsive reserve requirements are now based on expected inertia conditions, so it's not a static number as it used to be, but it changes uh, depending on time of day and months of the year. It allows us to save, uh, save some uh, money on reserves uh, during times with high inertia conditions and then procure more uh, during low inertia conditions when we actually need more. Um, system inertia and responsive reserve sufficiency is monitored in day ahead and into real time. Uh, we are on the track of implementing uh, critical inertia as a function of uh, real time N minus two contingency. And this will uh, allow us to reduce critical inertia at times when largest contingency is on maintenance or producing less than maximum capacity. Um, we just recently had changes uh, approved to ancillary services, which will introduce fast frequency response service, uh, and this will basically alleviate inertia concern, at least for some time. Uh, and then uh, another change that we see happening is that wind and solar generation are now, now starting to get interested to participate in ancillary services. And so, for example, we have several, several wind generators uh, qualifying and providing uh, regulation down service. Overall, just to conclude, uh, oftentimes we're being asked, uh, you know, how much percent of uh, penetration of you know, wind and solar generation um, our system is limited at, and we actually don't have a question, we don't have an answer to this question because the answer is it depends. It depends how we can adapt. Uh, how we operate our system and if we can make changes uh, to system operations, uh, we can uh, allow more production from uh, inverter-based resources in our system. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, my colleagues that uh, worked on all these uh, developments on this uh, dynamic uh, uh, res reserve requirements and changes of ancillary services and here's the list of my colleagues uh, that worked on that. Thank you very much, and I'm ready for questions. Okay, Julia, thank you very much for that walk through what's going on in ERCOT. We've got a, a number of questions here, a couple of similar ones. Uh, one of the ones that I'll, uh, I'll ask is uh, a question about the impact of, on the real-time LMP if the new fast frequency response product is implemented. Do you see any impact there? No, so right now ancillary services are procured in the day ahead, so I cannot see how uh, having faster frequency response would impact real-time LMP. Yeah, okay. Now, that being said, uh, ERCOT is currently working on real-time ancillary and energy optimization, but this is several years out, so I don't know how that will change things around. Okay, a question for the future. Also, a related question, well, how does system inertia feed into the ORDC operating reserve? Uh, ORDC? It doesn't. These are two separate things. Yeah, not really related. No. And a question about uh, publishing system inertia. Does ZERCOT publish system inertia? Uh, I believe we don't, uh, but that being said, this data after certain time periods is considered public, so it's anybody is interested, they can reach out to me. We can 
see what we can do. Yeah. Okay, and a question about uh, when you started using an N minus two contingency. When did you implement that? Uh, I'm not quite sure. That was before before I started NERC. This is this comes from NERC Bal 003 standard. So NERC that standard this determines uh, what contingency each interconnection has to uh, study and plan for. Uh, so for us, it's uh, two nuclear units, 2750 megawatts. Okay. Uh, and a question about uh, how you how you discovered um, the actual value of the inertia constants. What did it take to get the inertia constants from all those generators into your into your study? Uh, we had it in our dynamic models, uh, but then as we started uh, setting up inertia calculation, our dynamic group uh, worked with uh, generator operators and. Uh, Screwed up some of the values, so so that that should that should come in the generator design and uh, generator documentation. Uh, inertia constant should be there. Uh, sometimes it may not be uh, accurate in the model, but we reached out to the generator operators and uh, threw some of these values up. Yeah. And a question about who's providing. Uh Responsive reserve service from load today, or how is it being provided? Is it from the LSCs with large industrials, or from aggregators, or just how is that being carried out? Yeah, so these are large industrial loads. Uh, usually, they have uh, several processes uh, that are qualified, several like, process lines in the in, in the in the site that are qualified to provide uh, ancillary service, and they would circulate between these processes, not to always offer on one of them. And so each of these processes will have under-frequency relay um, to disconnect uh, as soon as frequency reaches 59.7 hertz. Uh, industries that are providing uh, these, the largest ones are chemical industry, uh, and then there are air separation plants that extract industrial gases, uh, natural gas compression sites, uh, oil fields, uh, industry process loads, and then there are a few large commercial sites, uh, mainly data centers. Uh, and then, I mean, the participation is limited uh, due to, uh, first of all, they, they would have to be interrupted instantaneously, uh, and then uh, they have to have real-time telemetry to our costs, so that, uh, that adds cost to them to have this uh, service implemented. But the largest ones are uh, chemical industry. Okay. Um, question about sources of fast frequency response. Where are, where are you thinking about it? Where do you think the sources of the fast frequency response will be? So uh, the most obvious, of course, would be uh, storage, battery storage, because this is something that, that, that they would be capable of doing um, then. As we were thinking about it, we reached out to some of load resources, uh, and uh, I guess depending on nature of the industry, they were some of them were saying that they were would be able to respond at a higher frequency trigger and uh, in faster time. So loaded storage, I would say. I can think of uh, maybe combining uh, what was called emulated or synthetic inertia from wind turbines. Uh, and keeping some headroom on wind resource. And that combination can also provide a service, a fast frequency response service within a time frame given. Uh, but because they would have to keep margin on their resource, uh, maybe it's not economical right now. I guess that brings up a, a related question a couple of people asked here, and that was, uh, are there any plans to compensate anyone for uh, providing this um, inertia service in the future? Not right now, but, 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 but maybe in the future. Good change. Yes. Sure. Yes, okay. but as, as I mentioned, you know, with, with, with this change, uh, even, even critical inertia concern kind of going away for a while because this base inertia that we already have uh, is higher than what critical inertia will be with fast frequency response introduced. So, so this 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 is just inertia that will be there no matter what. So, kind of value of this service uh, is decreasing a little bit. For now, it may change in the future. Yeah. 
Uh, a question about, um, do you have any reserves activated without a dead band? Or does a dead band apply to all the, all the resources? Uh, by protocols, uh, it's 15 or 17 millihertz for all resources, uh, but it may be that you know certain generators don't have it. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the requirement is uh, 17 millihertz uh, at, at most, so they can operate without if they wish to. Okay. You you mentioned in your present <clears throat> presentation that um, the current frequency control practices are. Uh, in effect for this change that you're making to the ancillary service market, which kind of left open the possibility that you might go to some different frequency control practice in the future when the inertia gets very low. Could you say anything about that? Yeah, so that basically what drove this. Uh, so when we, we determined critical inertia, that was based on uh, before this, this new ancillary services changes that just happened. Uh, and so that was based on the fastest responses, basically within half a second from old resources, and that drove uh, a little bit need for change uh, for ancil uh, of ancillary services. Um, so we, we we've seen that having faster frequency. So this this figure was made before before change of ancillary services was accepted or approved by uh, ERCOT board of directors. So this is showing that having um, earlier and faster frequency response allowed us, us to reduce critical inertia. And so you can, you can reduce it even more having even faster service. So at some point, uh, it will just settle, I guess. Right now, again, as we, where we are right now is that base inertia driven online by, by our operations is higher than uh, what would be critical inertia once fast frequency response is introduced. Okay. A couple of very specific questions. One, do you have any battery energy storage systems 75 MVA or higher? Uh, not as of now. So right now we have 89 megawatts of storage resources altogether. The largest is uh, 36 megawatts, I believe. Uh, okay. But we have some in the interconnection queues that are relatively big. Yeah. Would be bigger than 75. I wonder, do you see that affecting things much if it's 75 and it falls under the NERC, uh, I guess, BES guidelines? Uh, not really. So, so in our fast frequency response product, uh, there is right now a limit of 420 megawatts, and it can be provided even from a single resource. Okay. Another specific question uh, Is there anything which is preventing battery storage from providing both? Uh, contingency reserve service and fast, fast frequency response? Uh, I cannot think of any. If they can manage it on their side and prove that they are capable to control it separately, I, I cannot see why it would be a problem from our side. Okay. Um, one of the things that impressed me, Julia, is the uh, the large amount of inertia that you have um, kind of baked into the system from those three different sources. Mm -hmm. Do you see that uh, changing very quickly in the future? Um, do you see that um, you're going to be I, bumping up against inertia limits? You know, I think that so, so this is great component from nuclear resources. This, this will only change if, uh, if they retire. So this is kind of far, very far out. Yeah. Uh, I think the the component that will change once new ancillary services changes are implemented will be this one, because there will be more. So if uh, we have 420 megawatts provided by fast frequency response resources, then that will take uh, that might take a little bit from what currently is provided by generation. And so so this this component. Um, ancillary services provided by synchronous generation and bringing the airflow inertia online. This may go down somewhat, but we still have a minimum limit of how much should be provided by generation, so there still will be something here. 
And then private use networks, uh, as I mentioned, they use uh, generators to produce steam, and steam is used in the, in the chemical process, so it's petrochemical industries, and, uh, where they use steam for their processes and uh, energies, electricity byproducts. So we see them generating uh, or having a unit online even when prices are negative. So as they maybe change their practices or maybe retire some of this generation, this, this may also go down, but I think it's lower, uh, comp this, this component will go down slower. So, so this will be the first one to change, uh, even with implementation of new ancillary services, but these two mm, are less likely to change in the nearest future. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone asking a question about um, comparing the addition of inertia to the system, I guess it would be in the form of synchronous condensers uh, compared to going to fast frequency response sources. Have you looked at the trade-offs between those two alternatives? Do you have any situations today where you're even thinking about those alternative trade-offs? Um, we actually weren't, but it's, I think it's because the way of uh, how our market is designed. So synchronous condensers right now would be a uh, transmission asset. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, you know, ancillary services are provided by generation. Uh, so since synchronous condenser would provide inertia, also to mention uh, synchronous condenser's inertia is less compared to equivalent size generator because there is no turbine. Uh, and so uh, if, if, if we install synchronous condenser for for reliability needs, we'll just take its inertia into account. Uh, but then fast frequency response is ancillary service, so it's open to any technology that's capable of providing uh, at competitive cost to provide. Uh, so that's more of a market mechanism, where a synchronous condenser would go into rate payers, rate base. Uh, yeah, and so therefore, it's kind of like pushing costs on customers. Okay. Um, Question on the viability of batteries providing fast frequency response. I think the question goes more to the uh, the market aspects of getting compensated sufficiently for providing that service compared to providing other services. How do you see that service playing into the uh, the basket of services that energy storage will provide and get compensated for under the evolving market rules? So right now, uh, as I mentioned, we have ideas nine megawatts of uh, storage. Uh, the only service right now that they can provide in is uh, there is a sub-product of regulation service that I didn't talk much about today, but uh, it's basically they're providing regulation, get, getting paid the same as other generators providing regulation. But there is a 65 megawatt limit uh, on battery participation, so right now this uh, sub-service is already oversubscribed. So having this fast frequency response service within responsive reserve service uh, basically gives more opportunity to storage to participate. Okay. All right, there's, there's a, a number of other questions that we're not going to have time for. It's just two minutes before the top of the hour, so about, about time to wrap up. As I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the presentation and the audio file have been posted. And we'll also be posting the responses to the unanswered questions once, once they're ready. Julia has been very, very kind enough to offer to take a look at those and, and put up some short answers. I just want to let everybody know that we really appreciate your engagement. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. That's going to be on Tuesday, March 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern. The webinar will feature Sam Hartnett of the Energy Web Foundation and it will cover blockchain applications for the better integration of DER, distributed energy resources, for improved renewable energy tracking and creating new market opportunities. It's a very timely topic on the national scene today. And given the proliferation of PV power plants and the interest in transactive energy, I uh, hope you'll be able to join us to hear that. Further information on all the webinars and meetings can be found on our website at www.esig.energy under events and in our newsletters and the informational emails. So Julia, I wanna thank you again for this very timely and informative webinar and thank all of you for your participation. We look forward to seeing you once again next month, either on the blockchain webinar with Sam at the Spring Technical Workshop 
in Albuquerque, at which Julia will be presenting again, or in London. And in the meantime, take care, everyone, and especially stay warm and dry. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie.